Welcome to your next lecture in the Theorising Social Life module. Uh, this pre-recorded lecture is number six in the series and we're on to the subject of Marxism and we'll be discussing some of the key concepts in Marxism and, and the uh, ideas you need to be aware of and uh, arguments made by both Marx himself and his various subsequent followers and then getting on to discussing the apparent crisis in modern day Western Marxism that a number of critics have suggested that Marx's ideas are very dated and don't work terribly well in the 21st century and that Marxism has become something of a spent force so we'll look at arguments for and against that as we go along and you can make up your own minds as to whether you think it's still um, a political concept with things to offer and contribute to the modern world or whether you feel it's outdated and outmoded. In our last lecture together before half term we were looking at feminism and ideas around feminism and we got on to discussing social interactionism and an element of what we were starting to discuss was the idea that um, gender can be conveyed symbolically through clothing and mannerisms and gestures and so on but so can other things as well such as social class, uh, socioeconomic brackets and income, um, whether someone is deemed attractive or unattractive, notions of ethnicity, religion, all sorts of things can be conveyed through choices around dress and we started to discuss um, occasions on which each of us had been out recently and what we'd worn and why we'd worn it, why we'd chosen that article of clothing and so on and it's something you might want to have a think about so that when we do the live Q&A then perhaps you can spend a few minutes discussing the symbolic choices that you feel you make in your clothing decisions and, and what this conveys to the world, or at least what you hope it conveys to the world, and also you might have a few anecdotes about occasions when either you have succeeded in conveying the impression you wanted, or perhaps it's rather fallen flat, and we can then talk about how those ideas relate to Goffman and his sense of, of the dramaturgical theory, that sometimes we put on a role, but we don't always succeed in conveying the role we want to convey. Perhaps our, our choices of dress were meant to indicate one thing to other people, but those other people might have formed a very different impression of, of the kind of individual we are. So we'll, we'll discuss that in the Q&A. Now, in terms of recapping ideas around Marxism, as we go along we'll look at things like commodity fetishism, cons consciousness, um, false consciousness, the ownership of capital, and so on. Hopefully these will all be terms that are reasonably familiar to you and you feel confident in your grasp of. Uh, if there are any of these concepts that you feel uncertain about or, or you want to go over in more depth, flag that up in the live Q&A and we'll address those issues there in more depth. But some of these we will, like commodity fetishism, pick up as we go along anyway in this lecture. So the class warfare idea is something that Marx argues is um, the bedrock of understanding the history of the West and arguably of the East as well um, over the last few thousand years. Going back to ancient times when we lived in very small tribal societies, he says that there was no class warfare as such because those kinds of tribal societies were de facto socialist even though they would obviously never have used that term themselves, or heard, even heard of that term themselves, that capitalism developed as the centuries rolled on and new forms of industry developed, creating their own form of economics and social structure as they went. Um, into modern times, by which we're talking really the last few centuries, we see the development of what Marx calls the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. The proletariat are the working classes, those who have to toil for a living, uh, usually in, in manual jobs. And the bourgeoisie are the much smaller class of people who own the means of production. There is also a um, subsection to this, like the petty bourgeoisie, which is mostly small shopkeepers, owners of small-scale businesses rather than grandiose large-scale businesses. 
So chiefly what Marx meant by the bourgeoisie were the people who owned large scale businesses, but also large landowners. The ones who uh, had perhaps inherited land from their parents, grandparents, great grandparents, going back to the year dot, and who owned um, farms on those lands and employed people to work on those farms. The difference here being that the bourgeoisie own the factories, the farms, the, the mines, the various other forms of employment. They own the, the buildings, the land, the, um, the equipment when it comes to the Industrial Revolution and large-scale equipment needed to operate factories. And the proletariat bring their skills, their expertise, their time, their labour, the, the sweat of their brow to operating the farms and the mines and the factories and all of the various other things that the bourgeoisie own. Marx sees this as a conflict because the bourgeoisie want to get the maximum profit for the minimum outlay, whereas the proletariat would like to have a, a greater cut of the pie. They want to earn more money for their toil and their labour. Um, and ultimately, in a what Marx sees as a fair society, the proletariat would overthrow the bourgeoisie and reclaim the land on which farms are, are placed and mines and factories and all the rest of it and be able not only to reclaim the land but to lay claim to the factories themselves the buildings the machinery within those buildings which would then in enter into collective ownership rather than being owned by one individual or, or a small number of individuals and so for marx these two classes the working classes and, and fundamentally the upper classes are forever in conflict. There are counter arguments to this. So you might well say that someone who owns a, a factory and the people who work in the factory are all united in wanting that factory to do well so that it makes lots of profit for the person who owns it, but also equally at the same time pays the wages of all the people who work there. It's not in any of their interests for that factory to go bankrupt. Otherwise, not only does the owner lose a ton of money, but the people who work there all end up unemployed and out on their ear. So a counter argument might see proletariat and bourgeoisie working, at least in some instances at any rate, in a similar direction. Whereas for Marx, there is no similar direction because this is a relationship of exploitation and abuse rather than a relationship of the, the captain of a ship with the, the sailors, the, the passengers and the crew of the ship, all wanting the ship to arrive at its ultimate destination safely and, and in a timely fashion. Critics of Marx have suggested that his descriptions in Das Kapital and his various other works of society might well have been true of Victorian times, of life in the 1840s. The emphasis there being on the might, because some historians have criticised his lack of proper rigorous research and suggested that sometimes he just makes stuff up as he goes along, but that's an issue we'll get to as we go on. Um, however, what was true of 1848 isn't necessarily true of 2020. And so we, we come to this issue of whether or not Marx is become a bit of a, a spent force. Is it still relevant? Are these ideas still relevant in well, Britain, because that's where we live, so we'll focus on Britain for now, in the 21st century? Or are they simply historical period pieces describing the way the world was back in the 1840s? You'll have your own opinions on this and hopefully we'll find those out during the live Q&A. So it's not a happy scenario that he envisions. Historians have suggested that a lot of Marx's initial thinking, his research, um, in as much as he did research, which it's, it's a similar criticism to the one that psychologists, some psychologists at least, make of Freud, that he theorised very grandiosely from a very limited base of research. So both Freud and Marx have this tendency to 
um, do a minimal amount of research and come up with very, very large theories on the basis of it. Uh, and that maybe had they done wider research, they would have come up with quite different theories, perhaps. Leaving Freud to one side and coming back to Marx, his research was primarily in factories around London and, and other metropolitan areas. He wasn't looking at shop work, he wasn't looking at people who worked in hospitals, in schools, in theatres, on farms. He was looking chiefly at industrialised workplaces and the impact of the Industrial Revolution on those workplaces, effectively creating those workplaces. If we broaden our understanding of work as including uh, a great many other areas of life as well, such as the things we've just mentioned, hospitals, schools, theatres and so on, there's all sorts of different types of work. Do Marx's theories apply as well to hospitals or to the music industry or to um, people who work in television, in, in all sorts of areas? or? as some critics have suggested, are his theories chiefly of relevance to work in factories, to industrialised workplaces, rather than other types of workplaces. Again, this is something that hopefully you'll have your own personal experiences of. Some of you may have worked in factories, you may have worked in schools, in hospitals, in garden centres, in, in all sorts of places and you can bring your experience of all the different types of places you've worked in to bear on a, a live Q&A session and whether or not you think the theories we're going to look at as we go along are relevant to those types of places that you've worked in. He spoke about the idea of the superstructure. Uh, the superstructure is the way society at large works in terms of social class structure, in terms of who owns what where, in terms of how politicians operate and create, implement policies that serve maybe certain parts of society better than they serve other sections of society. It's the whole shebang, if you like, the whole way society operates, which is based upon econ an economic basis, an economic system. That economic basis is partly capitalist versus communist versus socialist, the sort of theoretical aspects of economics, but it's also down to the primary styles of production. So is an economy chiefly industrial? Is it chiefly service industry? For example, I live in Ipswich and whereas 60, 70 years ago there was a lot of industry in Ipswich, these days the vast majority of jobs available in Ipswich itself tend to be in the service industries, particularly in insurance. There's a lot of big insurance companies in Ipswich. So there's a lot of people whose jobs involve paperwork and handling and selling and, and investigating insurance policies and insurance claims. It's so office-based work rather than getting all grimy and sweaty working in a factory. Um, we're moving now into an information-based economy. So again, this idea that Marx's ideas perhaps are very suited to those cultures and periods of history which were heavily industrialised, but the question becomes, are they still relevant if your economy is chiefly a service-based one, or if your economy is an information-based economy? Or do other theories become more relevant to other types of economy? One of Marx's followers, Antonio Gramsci, as you know from past lectures, developed the idea of cultural hegemony. This notion that systems perpetuate themselves by immersing themselves in and being immersed by forms of cultural expression. Music, theatre, novels, these days, of course, also TV, film, the internet, sports, you name it, the list goes on and on and on. Ways in which we participate in wider society, and it's not just as forms of entertainment. It includes things like the educational system, the government, um, whatever religious system operates in a particular culture. 
these are all ways, he said, of perpetuating the system. Now, Kramsky was, being a Marxist, very, very critical of capitalism and was suggesting that capitalism itself perpetuates through all of those different routes. It is, of course, equally true that in communist countries, communism perpetuates itself through those various different routes. In the socialist countries, socialism perpetuates itself through those various different routes. So cultural hegemony is not something exclusive of and peculiar to capitalism. It can be argued to be part and parcel of all sorts of systems. Whether we're thinking in terms of politics and economics, or you could say religion perpetuates itself through cultural hegemony. Um, feminists often argue that notions of gender and, and gender stereotyping perpetuate themselves through cultural hegemony. There's all sorts of angles you can come at this from. But returning to Marx and his critique and, and Gramsci's critique of um, capitalism and big business. So not so much the, the petty bourgeoisie of the little shopkeepers, but the, the very wealthy at these days, billionaires and, and multi-multi-millionaires who own vast corporations. What power, influence, command do they exert through things like entertainment, news, religion, education? Something we can discuss in the live chat. But to get you thinking in this general area, uh, does a religion promote uh, particular ways of viewing the world? Does a religion promote more socialism or more communism or more capitalism or more something else? Uh, does the news critique individual billionaires and company owners or does it put out very positive, upbeat messages about those individuals? Does it highlight issues where big business needs to change? So things like um, industrial pollution and impact on the climate. Or does it sweep those issues under the carpet and allow big business to go on doing as it pleases? Likewise, uh, the entertainment realm is itself a big business, of course. The, the massive studios that make millions upon millions upon millions, probably into the billions, on an annual basis through films and TV shows and what have you. Do they promote certain views of the world and get everyone watching their films and TV shows to think in a certain way? Is it done deliberately? Um, Gramsci's notion of cultural hegemony was fundamentally to say no, it's not deliberate in the sense of some weird conspiracy involving people puffing away on big cigars in a locked room and planning how they were going to brainwash the minions rather that any system tends to replicate itself. So if you live in a culture, give you an example, where monogamy is the norm, you marry one husband or one wife and you stay with them until death or divorce kicks in, then what you'll see on the TV shows and the films and what have you will be monogamous couples, husbands and wives. You're not very likely to see polygamy where you've got one husband with three wives or one wife with four husbands. Whereas if you lived in a part of the world where polygamy was the norm and most people had several wives or several husbands, then the TV shows and the films and the stage plays and the, the novels and all of the rest of it would naturally tend to depict people living in polygamous couples. Not, again, because of some cunning conspiracy, but simply because the people who write novels or film scripts or what have you tend to replicate what they see around them on a daily basis so they will naturally tend to perpetuate those ideas as well as discussing this in class something i'd like you to have a go at doing at least some of you are doing it doesn't need absolutely everyone in class to do it but some of you um, to keep an eye open on the news if you, if you get a newspaper you might want to cut something out and bring it into class or print something off that you found on a website, maybe, which you feel illustrates whether or not big business does indeed exert power over one of the sorts of areas you've got listed on the screen. So it may be a clipping that shows it does exert power, or equally you might find a clipping, a news item, that suggests to you actually big business doesn't exert as much power as Gramsci would have suggested. So either direction, whatever you find and you want to discuss, if some of you at least bring in some ideas, 
that will make for a hopefully productive discussion in class next week. Uh, moving on to the idea of commodity fetishism, this is quite a broad, wide-reaching idea, so we only really have time to touch on it at a small degree, but it's something you can explore by reading around in much greater depth. Um, commodity fetishism is the encouraging the desire for amongst people to own certain products. It's what advertising agencies do all the time. That you've got to have this particular bar of chocolate because it's the best bar of chocolate ever. Or if you buy this type of car, then your your life will be transformed for the better. Or if you spray yourself with this particular aftershave, then all of the women or all of the men or, or whatever will be chasing after you and throwing themselves at you. And you'll become a sex god or a sex goddess. So the idea that if you buy this thing, it will make your life better is a form of commodity fetishism. It encourages people to want to amass certain things and to evaluate themselves by the things that they amass. So as per the cartoon on the screen where you've got the kid in the designer label clothing, designer labels are a form of commodity fetishism to be able to say, look at me, I, I own the latest style of jacket or shirt or, or pair of trousers or whatever it may be by this famous fashion house. At one level, a pair of trousers is a pair of trousers and as long as it does what a pair of trousers is meant to do, one pair is as good as any other pair. But clearly we don't think like that. Once upon a time the focus on clothing would be more around the quality of the material. Is this a long-lasting material? Does it keep you warm? Does it keep out the rain? Or is this cheap, shoddy material that will be threadbare and falling apart inside a couple of months? People were focused on those sorts of issues. The idea of fashion houses and you know, having particular designers of clothing is something that came about later on in society. And gradually, at least amongst the very rich to start with, and then, then filtering down and down the social tiers, we had this idea that people would brag about their clothing to say not only was it made of good quality material, but even better, it was made by this particular fashion designer, this particular tailor, this particular seamstress. And over time, those tailors and seamstresses started developing logos and, and stitching their logos onto their clothing so that you become the, the customer a walking billboard advertising their services and rather than expecting commission for advertising their services it becomes a, a positively desirable thing to have a particular logo on your clothes to prove that they are from the fancy fashion house and they're not just cheap knockoffs that's all commodity fetishism uh, because at one level you can argue what does it matter who made your jumper so long as your jumper is warm surely the practical functionality of the jumper is more important than the identity of who made it but once you get into the kind of society where the the identity of the person who made your jumper takes on this huge importance then you are into commodity fetishism because we start defining ourselves by what we own by what we have and that's largely regardless of whether we particularly like the thing that we have or not. So you'll get people who buy clothing or, or um, you know, get their house done up in a certain way with certain furniture in it, even if they personally don't really much like it, but they, they do so because they want to impress their neighbours or their relatives or whoever it is that they want to impress by being seen to have the right things, even if privately they'd prefer to have something else entirely. And so the ownership of goods becomes a way of defining ourselves. And uh, another modern day um, Marxist who's, who's more enamored of Marx than some of the people we'll be looking at as we go along, um, a chap called Zizek, Slavoj Zizek, argues that 
we, we are so immersed in commodity fetishism as a form of shaping identity that we almost don't know how to operate without it. And that extends as far as um, creating our religious identities, our political identities, our ethnic, our gender, our every other conceivable identity going. Buying the right images, the right slogans on our t-shirt, the right badges and political sentimentality. One of the issues he's particularly concerned about is the extent to which the commodity replaces the real core of the identity. So somebody says, oh, I'm, I'm a feminist, for argument's sake. Are they a feminist because they go out and they become politically involved in feminist activities? Or are they a feminist because they've got a t-shirt with a slogan on it that says they're a feminist? If it's the second case, in other words, their, their identity goes no deeper than buying the correct possessions, then that identity, as far as Zizek is concerned, is not worth having. Because it's replacing the core commitment of defining yourself by what you do, rather than by what you own. And that's a form of forced consciousness where you feel you're politically active, you're a right-on environmentalist or some such thing, because you own certain goods with slogans and badges and labels and whatnot, rather than because you do anything that would genuinely make you a, a radical environmentalist or a feminist or a Marxist or a whatever it happens to be. Uh, this is all part and parcel of the arguments around forced consciousness. Uh, Marx's original notion, which again dovetails nicely into what Gramsci was arguing around cultural hegemony, is that the people being exploited by the system are convinced of a number of factors by the very system itself. And education, religion, the arts, etc., all the things that Gramsci highlighted are the tools by which the elite at the top of society convince the people at the bottom of society to put up, shut up and stay where they are. So one of the things that the downtrodden become convinced of is that there is no alternative way of running society. It's this or nothing. That there cannot be a better alternative than what they've got now. Uh, and so if you don't think there's a better alternative, you won't make any effort to look for one or create one, you'll, you'll just go along with what you've got. Uh, another aspect by which people are convinced to stay complicit in the system is the idea that if there were to be any social change, it would make things much, much worse rather than better. And naturally enough, nobody wants things to get worse than they are. People only want them to get better. Will they genuinely get worse, or is this just a, a bit of um, propaganda whipped up by the elites to keep people complacent and, and quiet and submissive? Marx and Gramsci and others argued that it's propaganda rather than a realistic vision of what would happen if society were to undergo an upheaval and a change. Another element that keeps people in their place is a sort of carrot and stick aspect whereby certain people from the bottom of the heap are allowed to clamber a bit further up the slippery slope, but only a tiny number of them. And that tiny number are, are very well publicised, their, their names are trumpeted, because it keeps the rest hopeful. It dangles a carrot in front of everybody else that if they do as they're told, they, they play the game, then they too might be able to scramble a bit further up this, the slippery pole like the, this tiny number of well-known individuals have. So if, if you want a 21st century example of that, you could say reality TV stars or those pop stars and, and singers and what have you who have come from very working class backgrounds and have made it to the big time, have become famous singers or famous actors or famous whatever they are. And so even though they're a tiny, tiny number of people, they are very well known and they're much vaunted and much trumpeted. 
that they're now rich and they have a 25 bedroom mansion and um, sports cars and one thing or another that they came from humble beginnings and made good and therefore if they can do it is this a carrot being dangled under the nose of the vast majority who will never get out of the situation they're in to kind of keep them working keep them slogging on in the hope that they too will one day make it to the big time you, you might think that's a fair view or you might think that's nonsense so again something we can discuss in the live q a is it and this is a, a critique made of um, the marxist view is this something peculiar to capitalism because as far as Karl Marx was concerned, capitalism was the worst thing ever and it needed to be overthrown and replaced with a brand new system. And therefore everything that capitalism does is just awful and terribly and exploitative and abusive. Uh, various people have pointed out that any system, communist, socialist, Marxist, any otherist, will do exactly the same thing. It will encourage the vast majority of people within its society to go along with the system and tell them this is the only viable system, that there are no better alternatives, that they should, if there there are some of them suffering and, and not having very good lives, they should put up and shut up and things will get better eventually. And so there is always an encouragement to silent complicity. Otherwise we'd be overthrowing society every 10 minutes and no system would remain in place very long before somebody somewhere had a crack at bringing in a different system. Loy makes the argument that capitalism has taken on an air of almost religious authority about it. It's something we'll have a little look at as we go along before we get on to other aspects of Marx's theory and arguments. Uh, this quote from Walter Benjamin who is quite Marxist, said, um, one can behold in capitalism a religion. That is to say, capitalism essentially serves to satisfy the same worries, anguish and disquiet formerly answered by so-called religion. And you'll notice he has a very scathing view of religion there, so-called religion. Um, it's a notion that's also put forth by people who are not Marxist at all, who, um, people like Yuval Noah Harari, who argue that um, capitalism and money in general, if, um, this is one of the arguments we touched on a few weeks ago when we were talking about the symbolic interactionist approach to money, has this flavour of being rather like a religion. It, it, it's a slightly tongue-in-cheek comment. I'm not saying it actually is a religion, simply that it is quite like one, because it encourages faith in something much bigger, much grander than oneself, in this case society and an entire economic system, which billions and billions of people are participants in, um, which lasts much longer than any individual lifetime. And like religion, it promises good things. So whereas religions often say, if you, if you behave yourself and live a decent moral life, you'll go to heaven, or you'll reincarnate as something better than you are now, and that the future is rosy so long as you follow the rules and play the game. So people like Benjamin are suggesting that capitalism also makes grand promises about the future. If you play the game, you too could be rich, you too could have a bigger house and a better car and more possessions and so on. The key difference, of course, between capitalism and, and most religions is that where the majority of religions promise wonders in the future, some, some afterlife far distant from here, capitalism promises wonders in this lifetime. It's just not today. It's tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, next decade. Um, rather like the, the characters in Only Fools and Horses, that belief that this time next year we will be millionaires and um, will have made it big and will have made it rich. Does this keep people plodding along? Is this the carrot dangled before the donkey that keeps it walking? This belief that it will get better. Capitalism will solve problems and make things better. Now, some people, such as Steven Pinker, who we'll get on to near the end of the lecture, have suggested actually 
it does. This isn't a pipe dream, this isn't a hollow promise. Actually, capitalism has improved some things and done a better job of improving them than socialism or uh, communism, for example, let alone going back into history and looking at systems like feudalism. But we'll get on to these arguments as we go along. So other comparisons that are made, uh, Michael Walton there is, is keeping with the religious theme and suggesting that within um, capitalism, economics as a school of thought is the equivalent of a new theology of this go global religion of the market. Consumerism, its highest good, its language of head funds and derivatives as incomprehensibly esoteric as Christian teachings about the Trinity. I guess maybe he's tried reading a theology book and found out just how obscure some of that writing can be. Um, is he making a fair point? Is consumerism presented in capitalist societies as the highest good? That what makes life wonderful and fantastic and brilliant and amazing is that you can buy a brand new car and get rid of your crappy old car. You can buy the latest fashions you can have that fancy holiday in Hawaii, you can get this, buy that, do the other. And the nature of consumerism, of course, is that the, the latest car or the latest fashionable clothing is only fashionable for a short period of time. And sooner or later it wears out and there's another even more fashionable car, even more fancy up-to-date laptop, even flashier mobile phone than the one that was super duper flashy two years ago. And so objects that are consumed, I mean, some things obviously like food you've eaten, it, it, it's gone, but even things like cars and mobile phones and clothing, which in theory could last for years and years and years and years before they break or get worn out, nonetheless tend to be ditched before they've worn out because they are deemed to be of less value after the passage of time. They have become outdated, outmoded. There's an even fancier, more fashionable, more up-to-date version of the same thing available. And so the nature of consumerism is to place value on something, but own on an object, a possession, but only for a short period of time before it's devalued and you've got to go and get another thing that's even more upmarket, even more fancy and probably more expensive than the previous thing. If any of you have, have had meetings with bank managers and they've started using jargon terms, then you might get that sense of incomprehensible jargon. That notions like hedge funds and derivatives and the language of the market, unless you really try hard to immerse yourself in studying all of that, it can make about as much sense as a Catholic priest reading a Latin Mass in that it can go over the head of the people participating. Um, so uh, I suppose if you're very, very rich and you have your own hedge fund, you presumably would understand it. But to the vast majority of people in this country who don't have a hedge fund, do they even know what a hedge fund actually is? Do they really understand stocks and shares and all of the terms and jargons of the market? Or is this, this kind of ancient arcane language for the elite the, the wise people in the know and the rest of us just have to kind of trudge along. Eric Fromm, going back much further than the Michael Walton quote there, I am what I have, was being very satirical when he said that, and casting a scathing eye over this idea that identity, as back, far back as the 70s, let alone today in the 2020s, identity was largely purchased rather than created by soul searching and self-awareness and all the rest of it. You just buy stuff and you define yourself by the stuff that you buy. And if you don't like yourself anymore, well, buy different stuff and you will be understood in a different way. Is that still true? Not everyone is quite as negative. The quote from Charlie Reese there, um, capitalism is like math, American math, missing it, uh, 
It is amoral. It is good at producing wealth. It is bad at distributing wealth. Unless it operates within a moral framework, it will produce an unjust society. So Rees is saying that capitalism isn't automatically a bad thing the way Marx suggested, that it, it's a neutral force. It can be for the be betterment of society, which is the approach that Stephen Pinker takes, or it can be for the great detriment of society, as Marx suggests. In and of itself, it's amoral. So the morality must come from somewhere other than the marketplace, whether that's religion or philosophy or science or, or wherever. Um, economics is not per se a moral force. Uh, Max Weber had his own takes and his own views. We've touched on some of them in previous lectures, such as his argument that um, Protestantism developed the Protestant work ethic, which he says created modern day investment capitalism, or as it tends to be called these days, venture capitalism. Uh, critics have said, not quite. Historians particularly have suggested that he's putting the birth of venture capitalism a bit too late, and that actually venture capitalism had existed prior to the birth of Protestantism, but that, that's a historical argument rather than a sociological one per se. His idea, it, again, it's very much like Gramsci's notion of cultural hegemony, that religion, philosophy, can shape and form our economic policies and attitudes and expectations, and how we feel workplaces should operate, what we feel is normal or abnormal, healthy or unhealthy, in terms of human living conditions and the way systems operate. So the, the quick two-minute recap is the argument behind what modern-day Americans refer to as the wealth gospel, that God rewards hard work and industry and, and moral uprightness with material goods. So if you make it rich, you are having the big house, the big car, the, the fancy clothing and the whatnot, then that's a sign that you are a decent, upstanding person who has worked very, very hard to get what you have. And of course, there are going to be people who do work their backsides off and become materially successful as a result. But equally implicit, the flip side of the coin is that poverty becomes a punishment for sin, for laziness, for, for weakness, for being useless and gormless and feckless and making bad decisions. And certainly there will be people who are very poor because they make really stupid decisions and they don't work very hard and they end up like um, that the royal family comedy show where they're all slobbed on sofas doing nothing and being you know completely gormless and useless most of the time however it's equally true as, as critics have pointed out and continue to point out to this very day that there are people who work themselves to exhaustion and still get paid a pittance and, and can't afford the rent and there are plenty of people who inherit vast sums of wealth and never do a day's work in their life so their wealth is not the result of their hard work or their moral probity. It, um, some, somebody else's poverty is not the result of their laziness or stupidity. It's just the system itself often operates in a rather arbitrary fashion as to how some people lay their hands to a lot of money without much effort and other people can put in a tremendous amount of effort and are, are never financially valued for it by the system itself. In terms of his vision for the future, where the world was going, what it would turn into um, come the day, Marx believed there would be a revolution, a communist revolution one day, that would overthrow the system. And of course, in some parts of the world, in China, in Russia, in Cuba, and so on, there have been communist revolutions which have overthrown the world. And, well, not the world, they've overthrown the social systems of those particular countries and got rid of whatever was there beforehand and replaced it with a communist system. In Marx's dream, bearing in mind he never lived long enough to see his dream come to fruition, um, he imagined a world in which private ownership would be abolished. So a factory would not be owned by a millionaire or a billionaire. 
it would be owned by society, in effect the government. Therefore it would be owned by the people, the people who worked in that factory. And the profits generated from that factory would be shared evenly amongst the people who work there. So there wouldn't be a rich owner puffing away on a big cigar, creaming off 90% of the profit and, and sharing the remaining 10% out with the workers or whatever kind of division goes on. Rather, it would be shared much more equally so the workers would all be paid quite well, enough to live quite decent lives. Not only would the profits be shared out, but the very notion of a profit motive would itself not be abolished in law, it would just cease to exist de facto as a result of having a communist system in place. So the profit motive is the idea of somebody like, let's say, Alan Sugar, who was born into poverty and is now super rich. So his profit motive was that if he worked hard and made really clever deals he would make more money and that profit would be his it would go into his bank account and he'd be able to spend it on whatever it is that he likes spending his money on and so his motivation for getting out of bed in the morning and working really hard and maybe working all through his weekends and not taking the holidays and not doing this not doing that in order to keep working 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 is money uh, making plenty of money and being able to keep it himself and obviously maybe not just money for its own sake but specific things he wanted to spend that money on maybe he really wanted a particular type of car or a house or whatever it was he wanted and, and so that is part of the profit motive partly wanting cash but also wanting the things that cash will acquire for you in a communist society there would be no private enterprise, there would be no businessmen or businesswomen. Um, um, sorry about this, I don't know how to turn that damn thing off. Um, there was only ongoing wealth. No, sorry, ongoing wealth for the community, not wealth for the individual. Um, the wealth of the community would be accrued via government and via government would then be disseminated out to the members of society so everyone would gain rather than one particular person or one particular family gaining massive amounts of profit it would be shared amongst all and sundry <sighs> sorry about this not ah right it's turned itself off good um I've lost the plot now. Yes, anyway, so in a communist society, people would have more profits and you wouldn't have one or two really, really rich people and other people in crushing poverty. You'd have everyone on roughly the same amount of money as each other. And as a result, they'd all be happier and jollier and, and, and living much nicer lives. And people would go to work because they wanted society to benefit from their efforts, not because they wanted a ton of money. If we look at those countries which have had, or still do have, communist regimes in them, Russia, China, Cuba, Venezuela, and so on, they have pretty horrific track records. The photograph you've got there is of a Russian gulag, where people who failed to do as they were told by the Communist Party were packed off to outer Siberia to live in a gulag and have their heads shaved and be forced into hard manual labour, Many of them died in, in vast, vast numbers. It was a miserable, miserable existence. Not a lot better than the kind of concentration camps that were running in Nazi Germany. Pretty horrific. Um, some statistics here part, compiled by Rummel back in 2002. These are approximations because a lot of the countries in question did not keep very 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 accurate records of numbers of deaths so this is based upon existing records and a, to a degree a bit of guesswork a bit of projection we won't go over all of this but to give you a, a, a few examples of the communist countries on here you can see there's a couple right at the very top so under Russia 
um, particularly under Joe Stalin's rule, uh, well over 42 and a half million people murdered during Stalin's um, regime. He ruled from 29 to 53. Uh, and it's there are estimates that put it actually considerably higher than 42 and a half million people. Um, that's a combination of people exterminated in gulags, murdered in purges and show trials, but also a lot of mass starvation deaths where Stalin introduced some really appallingly bad agricultural policies and millions upon millions upon millions of people starved to death as a result in his own country. So this is not Russia going to war and killing other people. This is Russia killing its own citizens. In China under Mao Zedong, um, almost 38 million people. And again, that is something of a conservative effort, um, estimate. I've seen estimates that's significantly higher than that. Uh, and again, likewise, a combination of massacres, purges, um, death camps, um, which I mean, you, the situation with the Uyghur Muslims to this very day, they're being interred in gulags and camps, supposedly for their re-education, but there are some very, very sinister things going on there to this very day. So even though Mao Zedong has been dead since the 70s, things have not necessarily changed greatly in terms of the Chinese Communist Party's policies. A vast number of the deaths here are also down to, again, starvation. One of the most prolific, starv in fact, arguably the most prolific starvation um, famine in history that killed the biggest number of people took place in China under Mao Zedong's rule and wasn't down to um, disease in the food or anything like that or bad climate it was down to his appallingly bad agricultural policies and the fact that no one was was brave enough to stand up against him or at least those who did try and stand up against him were shot and so people just went along with the policies they were ordered to go along with and millions upon millions upon millions of people starved to death as a result but it got hardly any publicity in the wider world um, then we drop down to nazi germany um, so extreme left-wing and extreme right-wing systems killing phenomenally large numbers of people um, e even before Mao Zedong came in um, Chiang Kai-shek who was there prior to Mao Zedong that was more of a, a militarist regime that came in in the aftermath of the Boxer Rebellion um, Chiang Kai-shek's system was not fascist in the right-wing sense, it was a left-wing regime, but a very, very ty a tyrannical left-wing regime. And so you can see list after list after list there of phenomenally high death rates, uh, of people slaughtering their own populations on a grand scale. Some right-wing examples, but plenty of hard left-wing examples. So political extremism in either direction results in, in massacres and vast numbers of deaths. Why is that? What's the problem? What's going on there? Um, these are the questions to be asked. If, it, if communism and Marxism was all as idealistic and lovely and wonderful as Karl Marx envisioned it being, why are we looking at 42 and a half million deaths in Russia? almost 38 million deaths in China. Why are we looking at almost two and a half million deaths in Cambodia? Why? What's the weakness in the system that it produces horrific results like that instead of the let's all skip through the daisies hand in hand having a lovely time of it that Marx envisioned? I have no answers for that one. It's something for you to think about and reflect on. Uh, part and parcel of um, the theories that emerge from Marx into the 20th century is critical theory. Critical theory has its roots in Marxism, but branches it off in slightly different directions. Now, we've looked at the Frankfurt School in past lectures this year, as well as during your first year. Um, and we'll be getting back to the Frankfurt School again next week when we start looking at the ideas of Jürgen Habermas, 
who is still alive and going strong and is one of the leading lights of the modern day Frankfurt School in the sociology. Critical theory takes this idea of class warfare and starts to examine it from different directions. And it leads to other forms of political ideology. So some forms of feminism, not all forms, but some forms of feminism like Marxist feminism, take the idea that uh, class warfare as an illustration of a society within a state of conflict, within a sort of civil war within itself almost, plays out not just in terms of class, but that kind of conflict, that kind of warfare within a society plays out in terms of gender, of conflict and oppression and abuse and exploitation between men and women rather than between the upper classes and the working classes. Critical race theory, which we'll get onto towards the end of the course, makes a very similar argument, but that instead of talking about gender, critical race theory talks about racial divisions and looks at a society and says, oh, white people oppress black people. And there is um, race warfare, racial tension, rather than gender tension or class tension and looks at things in terms of conflict between different races, usually within very specific countries. So critical race theory is applied extensively into America and European countries. You don't hear many people talking about critical race theory in Zimbabwe or Nigeria. That doesn't mean they can't, it just means they don't. Because you could argue, and indeed it's one of the arguments we'll look at when we get on to talking about it later in the course, that there are certain agendas at play here which prefer to look at some issues and not at others. Um, there are certain issues they much prefer to turn a bit of a, a blind eye to. Uh, the quote you've got on the screen there from Max Horkheimer, that critical theory is there, to liberate human beings from the circumstances that enslave them, is straight back to Marx's original idea, which we've discussed several times already in class, that sociology should not simply describe society as it is, but rather should proscribe routes and methods and techniques which would liberate society and or more specifically liberate people within society from oppressive situations. So critical theory is very much picking up on that aspect of Marxist ideology and whereas Marx it was liberating the working classes from the oppression of the upper classes the, the other varying types of critical theory that have developed in the decades since. Some of them are, are about liberating women from oppression by men or liberating ethnic minorities from oppression by ethnic majorities. Uh, or likewise, queer theory um, tends to focus on liberating sexual minorities from what are perceived as being the oppressive views of the sexual majority all of which tends to take the notion that these groupings, racial groupings, gender groupings, sexual orientation groupings, social class groupings, every single one of them is a social construct. Now clearly social class is. It's difficult to argue any, any other way on that one. Um, but there are ardent biologists, psychobiologists, sociobiologists, etc., who will point out that gender and um, sexuality and to a point at least race have a biological component to them which critical theorists tend to reject very vigorously. And we have this argument about um, the scientific basis of this idea, uh, are the ideas around biology and the, the biological components of human identity raging on and on and on between those who are very hard left-wing and those who are more centrist or right-wing or even mild left-wing for that matter rather than hard left-wing. Um, the notion of critical theory is to critique and understand the conflicts within a given society in particular historical periods um, understanding that society develops the way it is these days as a result of conflict within those societies, particularly conflict in the form of oppression by one group of another group, usually a small group of a much larger group, but sometimes different ratios. 
where it is to the advantage of one group to gain a control over another group, to exploit them, rip them off, benefit from their efforts, their labour, their work, and the other group just kind of coast whilst they benefit. Um, part of critical theory is also trying to unite the various things you've got listed on the screen there, economic, sociology, history, etc. Um, and, and saying all of these academic disciplines have something to offer and add, but also that all of these disciplines exist as a creation of the inequalities in society. So the kinds of people who traditionally at least have gone to university to study anthropology and psychology and economics and so on have come from a certain social elite because their parents up until fairly recently had to be rich enough to pay for them to go to university. And the universities are run by the upper classes and perpetuate the values and ideologies, we're back to Gramsci again, of the upper classes and disseminate them through the academic subjects that they teach. So it is both a utilising of these various different academic disciplines to all come together and understand the nature of society, but also a critique of those academic disciplines to say that they are the product of the very system of inequality that they are studying. It's a lot of argument that goes on. Um, with John McMurtry's um, theories and ideas, he picks up on a number of concepts which overlap with Marxist ideas as well as going in some of them in slightly different directions, but sort of building on and extending from Marx's ideas. So he talks about life needs. Uh, a life need is also an idea phrased slightly differently that Judith Butler picks up on when she talks about human frailties and um, weaknesses and the term she uses is precarity which we'll get onto in more detail towards the end of the, class, uh, the course. But it's a similar sort of thing that there are certain needs we have without which our capacity to survive and thrive is greatly reduced. So for example medical support and care you could manage to live without medicine, so long as you're lucky and you never get ill and you never have an injury. But clearly, if medicine is taken away from you, or made so expensive you can't afford it, then the likelihood of you surviving to great old age and enjoying a fulfilling life is significantly reduced. It's not impossible, but it is greatly reduced. Uh, and so life needs are anything without which our capacity to survive and thrive is significantly dented. Uh, life capital is any system within a human life or the wider ecological picture that reproduces itself, or at least it will do if it's not exhausted and exploited. So for example, forestry is life capital. Um, you can chop down trees to build your houses with and so on. But if, if you're sensible and wise, you will, of course, keep for every one tree you chop down, you'll plant two or three trees to grow in its place. So that there'll always be more and more and more in forests into the future. Uh, obviously, we know that hasn't always happened. That's why we are in the, the situation we're in nowadays with the world um, ecological crisis, because too often we've just chopped down and chopped down and chopped down without replacing. In the delusion that trees were an inexhaustible supply and we didn't need to do anything to help maintain the supply. Um, things which will run out, so coal and oil, do not count as life capitals because they are finite, they will run out. So it's, your capital is stuff that can be reproduced, that can go on creating. Um, in terms of understanding how economics work, how human society works, McMurty argues for these four principles and concepts that you've got on the screen there. Uh, life ground uh, is the idea of all of the things that we need, and again this is quite similar to Judith Butler's ideas of precarity, that we need to keep us alive at all. So it's not, whereas a life need is something you could survive without, but would struggle to have a really good life without. If you take away someone's life grounds, they're not going to survive at all. So if you took away someone's food supply, 
because there was a famine or you were just deliberately starving them, as per the examples we mentioned with China and Russia, um, then, then obviously somebody's not going to last very long without food. It's, it's only a matter of, of days before they start starving and only a matter of weeks before they starve to death entirely. So it's, it's things like that. Life ground consists of things like food, fresh water, um, uh, a roof over your head that you would really struggle to survive at all if they were taken away from you. Life values are factors that um, increase the worth of life, the, the, the joy of life, um, the, the, the good, the benefit of life. That can be in the sense of making life more worth living for the individual. Like me and books, having books makes my life more worth living. Um, but it can also be uh, other factors in life that are more generic, so not down to an individual person, but are more generic um, on the wider picture. So again, going back to things like medical care, having um, gynecological and reproductive medicine, midwives and so on, improves not for my life specifically, obviously, being that, but for the bigger picture of humanity, by improving the likelihood for as many women as possible to give birth safely, to control their own reproductive patterns so they're not wearing themselves out or if they're struggling to get pregnant in the first place and they really want to, they're assisted through artificial insemination and various other kinds of techniques to do so. So it, it improves the capacities of human life to reproduce and survive and, and flourish. Um, not just in the qualitative sense of making life more enjoyable for certain individual people, but for the broader human picture that there are certain services which benefit large numbers rather than small numbers of people. Life capital we've already touched on already. Um, civil commons is uh, an idea found well, pre-communism actually, pre-Marxism, uh, the, the idea of common ground goes back to medieval periods and earlier, whereby there'd be certain fields, for example, or pastures, which did not belong to the lord or lady of the manor, but were held in common by all of the people in the village, so that any of them could go and graze their sheep or cattle or whatever it is that they had on that common land, because it did not belong to any one person. It was shared in common by the whole community. And that's an idea that both McMurty and Marx and various other people have suggested is a good thing to bring back, not just grazing land for cattle, but the idea of goods, services, products held in common by all people and that anyone can access. So you could say the NHS is a civil common because we can all access it um, no matter how much or how little we have chipped into it. So whether you're a billionaire who actually does pay your taxes or whether you only moved to this country three weeks ago and you need to see a doctor and you haven't yet paid a penny in taxes, you can still access that system. So it's a civil commons, it's there for everyone in the community and it um, makes life better for people. And there may be other kinds of things that you can think of in the Q&A that you'd like to see as civil commons, things that more people should have access to. A library, for example, the, the public libraries are an example of the civil commons. What's left of them these days? So that everyone can go into a library and borrow, well, once they've registered in the library, they can borrow a book, or even if they don't register, they can still go in the library and sit there and read the books. It's a civil commons. Uh, and these are factors which McMurty says make life better and fairer for all and sundry, to have more civil commons and to have government focused on developing life values and understanding life grounds and improving the quality of them and not taking them away but actually making them more readily available to more and more people. Uh, we touched a little bit on Marxist feminism the week before half term, but just a reminder that uh, Marxist feminists are a specific type of feminist who believe that the system of oppression is not specifically of men 
sorry, oppression by men of women. Rather, it's an, an oppression by a ruling social elite, the super duper rich, of absolutely everybody else, men and women alike. And that men are as oppressed by that system as women, but in different ways, obviously. And therefore, the plight of women goes hand in glove with the plight of men because it's the way the system as a whole operates and it's there for the benefit of a social elite rather than the benefit of specifically men or, or you know, specifically one half of the population. It's not, it's a tiny elite rather than half the population. And capitalism is seen as part and parcel of that oppressive system, which is why it's Marxist, because they, they have this um, view of capitalism as the super rich gaining everything and exploiting everybody else in the process. That's what they see capitalism as. In their view, in the capitalist system, and again, some people have suggested this is somewhat dated and goes back to an earlier period of, of uh, history when things were more like this than they are today, then men would be working all hours going in back-breaking jobs. The vast majority of men had hard manual jobs, very few had cushy desk jobs well-paid desk jobs most had back-breaking manual labor jobs that paid them very very little and they'd be working there all day and half the night and when they finally lurched off home it was the job of the wives their daughters their mothers their sisters whatever women were in their lives to look after them feed them water them make sure there was a bed for them to sleep in etc ready for them to tip back out the next day to the next round of back-breaking manual labor and so the idea of women being chained to the kitchen sink and having to do all of the domestic work is because the men were at work all day and therefore the women needed to be at home to ensure the men could be at work. And obviously that's a somewhat lopsided view of history in that there were a lot of working women who were going out to factories or fish gutting plants or what have you and tilling the fields and the rest of it. It wasn't just men working but but this is a kind of slightly, slightly lopsided view of history. And they see the exploitation and abuse of women as hand in glove with the exploitation and abuse of men. And the rather controversial idea that we explored the week before half term, a little bit at this, was this notion that domestic violence is inherent to the capitalist system and therefore would not be found in the communist system, the socialist system, etc which turns out not to be true in the slightest. Because there's no shortage of domestic violence in communist countries or socialist countries. Uh, so their, their notion was that domestic violence, you'd have the, these men working themselves half to death who'd be raging at the system and, and, and want to tear down the system and string their boss up, but they couldn't do it because they didn't have the power to do it. So they'd come home in, in a towering rage and who would they vent their spleen on in sort of Freudian displacement fashion, it would be their wives, their daughters, their their sisters, girlfriends, and equally you could point out it, not just their daughters but their sons as well. They'd vent their spleen and want to, um, but they they would rage at home, and the women would become like the punch bags that enable the capitalist exploitative system to keep running. Because if the men weren't able to vent their spleen in the domestic arena, then it would only be a matter of time before they vented their spleen directly at the ruling elite and there would be a revolution and the system would be torn down. Now, we discussed some of your views on this before half term, but we can pick up again in the Q&A on your views still today on that one. Um, a couple of other ideas that uh, Marx put out and which are still adhered to by quite a few of his followers. One is historical materialism. It's actually a key tenet of Marxism. Um, historical materialism is the idea that the means of production, the materials of production, so whether you've got a, say, a, a mostly farming society or a mostly factory-based industrial society, or these days, long after Marx's death, an increasingly um, information-based society with computing systems as the, the dominant form of making and earning money. The, the historical drivers of society of making money are the force 
that shapes the very society itself and shapes the relationships between people in that society with the various methods of production and how they operate. So the notion is that if society is mostly agricultural, as we used to be a few hundred years ago in, in Britain, then the, the chief source of value is land, um, specifically fertile land. You know, this, um, arid, mountainous land isn't of much worth to anyone, but good farming land is, is worth its weight in gold. And so the system you end up with is an elite of people who claim the land for their own and say, look, this, this, this 10 square miles of fields here, these all belong to me. And anyone who says otherwise will be beaten up or put in prison or shot or something. Um, and then goes on to employ serfs, as was the case in this country a few centuries ago, quite a few centuries ago, to till the fields. And in exchange, the serfs get certain benefits. But the serfs are there to do the work and the aristocrat is there to um, cream in the profit from the serfs tilling the fields and growing crops and vegetables and whatnot looking after cattle and all of that. Then as society moves from being mostly agricultural to become mostly industrial, a lot of those aristocrats, not all of them because they were the nouveau riche coming up from outside, but the, the elites moved from being landowners to being factory owners and investing their wealth in factories and the new types of machinery that were being invented during the Industrial Revolution. And so the, the put-upon classes moved from being farm labourers to being factory labourers. And it changed the nature of the relationship between landowner and tenant to a relationship between factory owner and employee. Um, quite what the relationship is these days in the information economy, I don't know, but we can discuss that in the q &A. Um, it's similar to the idea of technological determinism, which we've touched on in past lessons and, and also in the first year. Well, the, the main difference being that technological determinism is a theory that also applies to small scale technological changes, whereas historical materialism is looking at the big picture stuff. There's a lot of criticism of historical materialism that it's not so much the technologies that drive society as it is the societies that drive the technology but we, we can discuss that in the q LTV stands for labour theory of value and the labour theory of value this is Marx's idea about how to work out the value of stuff both how it's worked out now but also how it would be worked out in the communist paradise that would come into existence when his ideas were put into place that one didn't work either his argument was that the value of a, an object, let's say a, a, um, the value of a jumper, for argument's sake, would reflect the amount of effort put into making the jumper. So uh, raising the sheep, shearing the sheep, preparing the wool, dyeing it, um, turning it into yarn, then knitting the jumper. All of that would reflect in the value of the jump up, the, the price tag on the jump up. Likewise for services, so the amount of how much you would pay for a carpenter or a plumber or these days an electrician would depend on how much effort went into what they were doing to create that service. And so in, in the um, brave new world that Marx was envisioning, the economic value of, a, of an article for sale or of a service would be determined chiefly by the amount of labour put into its creation. Not everyone has gone in for that idea. In fact, the vast majority of economists and theorists have not gone in for that idea, have said it's a bit daft. Um, Alfred Marshall is an example of someone who said that um, part of his argument is that the value isn't just the amount of time it takes to knit the jumper before you sell it. Uh, if you work in a factory, let's say it's a factory that churns out hundreds of jump, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of jumpers a day on, on their machinery rather than an old lady with a pair of knitting needles, then not only do you have the amount of time it takes to operate the machine to produce the jumper, but if some factory owner has invested a million quid in buying the machines and setting them all up and buying mountains of wool to knit jumpers with, 
their investment is part of what determines the cost of the jungle. Like it or loathe it, it does. Um, so Marshall is saying you, you've got to factor that in. It's not just the whether it takes 10 minutes or an hour for an individual member of staff to make a jumper. You've got to factor in the running costs of the entire factory, the amount of financial investment in that from small number of individuals, and then wanting their investment back. All of that needs to be factored in. He also talks about the issues of supply and demand. If it takes an hour to make something, you put an hourly rate on it perhaps, but what if no one wants to buy it? Does that value have any meaning if no one wants it in the first place? Surely an element of the price tag, the worth of an item, is set by whether anyone wants it or not, and how much they're prepared to pay for it, which is a capitalist argument that um, supply and demand alter the value of goods and that if you can, can get people willing to part with more money for something you should do and that doesn't necessarily reflect always the amount of effort you put into making it so some things might take a long time to make but no one wants to buy them other things might be very quick and easy to make and lots of people want to buy them and are prepared to fork out more and more money for them we could also flag up the issue of expertise and efficiency. Uh, a very skilled worker can normally do their job quicker than someone who is new to that job. The, the longer you've been doing it, the quicker you get at doing it by and large, especially thing with, with manual labour and so on. And so you might have a very experienced person who can manufacture, let's say, a, a baker making bread. The, the brand new baker who's only just started in the job, let's say he takes half an hour to make one loaf of bread whereas the very experienced baker maybe she can churn out 20 loaves of bread in half an hour so does the fact that she can make make a loaf of bread in five minutes mean that that loaf of bread is worth less than the loaf of bread that takes half an hour to make because the person is less experienced at what they're doing and just is it therefore slow so is it just effort or are there other factors to think about in determining the value of work? Of the critiques made of Marxism and around Marxism, um, Friedman, uh, Milton Friedman, who is an American economist, very much a capitalist, uh, says socialism is a rather naive idea. And perhaps inevitably he would say that, being a hardline capitalist, but uh, let's listen to his criticism anyway. Um, why is it a naive idea? Because he says it involves authoritarianism. In effect, it's saying that the government steps in and says to individuals, you are not allowed to work for your own personal gain. You are not allowed to work for your own personal profit. You must work for the good of the community, for the good of others. And therefore, it puts a stop to people buying and selling as they want to people being innovative as they want and it's it brings everything under the control of the state and start and the state seizes the profits that they make in order to distribute them collectively so you could work your backside off at a job and let's say you're a, you work in sales and you manage to sell a thousand pounds worth of stuff in a week and the person who works alongside you manages to sell 20 quids worth of stuff in a week, the government will step in and take the £1,000 and the £20,000 and pay you what it sees fit. So your greatest skill at selling does not profit you at all. You get paid the same amount as the person making a low-level profit makes. Mikhail Bakunin, who had started off being a close friend of Marx and ended up falling out with him, he made a similar sort of criticism that Marx's view of government, a communist government being the regulating factor, he, he was kind of arguing, a bit like George Orwell only a lot earlier, that you'd end up with an animal farm situation. You'd go from being governed by czars, Russian czars and aristocrats and elites, 
to being governed by the ruling bigwigs of the Communist Party, who would be just as tyrannical, just as abusive, just as, as much pigs with their noses in the trough as the old aristocracy had been. And they would be lording it over people and passing laws and forcing them to do as they were told. There would be a loss of individual freedom. Bakunin became much more enamoured of anarchism, which places a lot more emphasis on individual freedom and autonomy than communism does. Uh, and history has proved Bakunin to be correct on that particular incident, on that particular claim, in that we can see lots of examples of authoritarianism in Russia, in China, in Cuba, and so on. Uh, Zoltan in 99 puts forward the argument that if everyone gets paid much the same, so the idea of, of the communist society is you don't have a tiny number of people who are super rich and other much larger number of people who are very, very poor, rather you have everyone on roughly the same kind of an income. So the wealth is shared evenly through the whole of society. No, no rich elite, no ground down poor underclass. If everyone is getting much the same, so if, it doesn't matter if you're a brain surgeon or a dustman or a um, ballet dancer, that is topical for you at the moment, um, whatever you might be, you get paid roughly the same amount. What incentive, says Zoltan, is there to work really, really hard or do a really, really difficult job? Most people's incentive, Zoltan asks, argues, and you could say this is maybe symptomatic of a capitalist system, would a communist system be very, very different? Let's discuss in the Q&A. But the chief motivation for a lot of people is personal gain. They, they do a really hard, difficult job with long hours and it's maybe very challenging because it pays better than some other job. And so they go out of their way either to work longer hours or to do a more responsible, challenging job because, in part at least, of the material rewards. If there are no material rewards, why would you want to be a brain surgeon? Why would you want to work 45 hours a week if you got the same amount of pay doing a job working 30 hours a week? What would be the reward and the incentive? Now you could counter that by saying, well, there are other reasons to do a job. You might want to be a doctor because you really care about people and you want to help them, not just because of the amount of money you get paid. And clearly there is more to motivation. This is something that Michael Sandel picks up on. There are more types of motivation out there than just cash. But, but, is cash the dominant one? Zoltan says yes. You may agree, you may disagree. Um, a little aside here, a little thought really. Uh, it's a survey done in 2006 in America looking at um, professors. I should just explain that in America, um, anyone with uh, an academic teaching post is referred to as a professor. Whereas in this country, you have to um, get a PhD and then eventually after you jump through a few other hoops, you have the potential to be awarded a professor ship and a seat within a university. So a British professor is a lot more academically accomplished than an American professor in order to get their title at any rate. So this is American university teachers, lecturers, basically. 3% um, of them in general, across all subjects, identified as Marxists. When it was broken down by specific subjects like chemistry and engineering and so on, um, they found that 5% of them in the 5% human of humanities lecturers identified as Marxists and 18% of social scientists, so sociologists, psychologists, etc., identified as Marxist. So there was way more in the social sciences than there were in chemistry or medicine or, or anatomy or what have you. That was in 2006. I suspect if they did it again now as a test, they'd probably find those percentages, especially in social science, somewhat higher. So is Marxism of academic appeal to people like sociologists rather than in the general public, rather than in other areas? Does this create a skewed imbalance in the nature of how certain subjects are taught and understood 
um, and maybe give a rather unrealistic view of the popularity of certain ideas and their appeal. And that's something we can talk about in the Q&A. This is the quote from Steven Pinker, who I mentioned earlier. Now, Steven Pinker is a psychologist, but we will allow him to be mentioned in sociology because his quote here is a relevant one to what we're talking about. He's got a much, much more upbeat view of capitalism than the people we've looked at so far. And rather than seeing it as, as this terrible, wicked thing that leads to exploitation, he says, actually, as a system, within certain restraints, he's, he's not in favour of total gloves off unrestrained capitalism, but under certain restraints, he says, capitalism has done a damn sight better for the world than previous economic models or current alternative economic models. So as per the quote, capitalism saved the world. And there is even a heretical theory now moving up from the level of individuals to countries. Countries that trade more and have more open economies are less likely to fight wars and less likely to have genocides. Which takes us back to the death rates we were quoting earlier in that table of um, what's sometimes referred to as genocide or democide, the, the killing off of your own people, the demos, the people, within um, co communist countries being very, very high, noticeably higher than it is in capitalist countries. Um, his argument partly is that capitalism invests in areas that are of benefit to people. So we're kind of going back to Zoltan's argument here. If you were uh, a research virologist you're, you're studying viruses and obviously that's very hard work very time years and years and years of study to become a, a qualified virologist and learn how to find cures for viruses and diseases and what have you if you were paid exactly the same amount per hour as someone stuck in shows in tesco's would you put that much effort into it now Pinker, rather like Zoltan, suspects not. Suspects that, yes, people do those kinds of jobs because they want to save lives and there's a real humanitarian element there. However, an, a big key driver is the fact that they will make money out of it. They'll be paid well, they'll be in a high status job, they'll be able to live a nice life and look after their families very, very well financially. And also, of course, the people who invest the tons of money required to keep those laboratories operating whilst research goes on for years and years and years before the cures are ever actually found, that money tends to come from venture capitalists who are hoping that once the cure is found, they will make such a massive profit they'll get their investment back and then some. Would a communist state, which has no eye to profit margins, be investing shed loads of money for year after year after year after year into laboratories researching cures for diseases when the there is no financial gain. The gain is to human life. Do communist governments care enough about human life to spend a ton of money trying to save people from dying of diseases? Or, as, as Pinker somewhat implies, would they just kind of write them off as a worthwhile loss? Uh, likewise, lots of other devices have been invented and developed chiefly by people wanting to make a lot of money, driven by the capitalist ethos rather than driven by a communist or a socialist or some other style of ethos. So he's not denying that capitalism causes problems and things like sweatshops and exploitation and so on. However, he's saying in recent years, well, recently, up to about 150-ish years now, the tide has started to turn the exploitation of things like sweatshops has become more and more reined in and the benefits of capitalism are shown more and more and more such that in the room I'm now sitting in recording this lecture I probably have more books, more possessions, more ornaments than a great many very 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 rich aristocrats from a thousand years ago would have owned. So if one of them could time travel and meet me now and just look at the contents of this room, they would probably think I was super duper rich. Sadly, I'm not. <laughs> but my standard of living compared to the standard of living 
a thousand years ago is phenomenally high. Indoor plumbing, indoor toilets, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not having to go and pee in a hole in the corner of a field or in a bucket and sling it out the window. Um, dysentery is tackled, diphtheria is tackled, all sorts of problems that would have beset our ancestors even 150 years ago, let alone hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, have been solved and cured. And our standard of living now is phenomenally higher than our ancestors. I have more liberties now, more freedoms now, living in Britain, than people hundreds of years ago would have had. Excuse me. Um, so it's placing these things in context. Um, his argument is that society today is, is significantly better than society of hundreds of years ago. And the chief driver of that is that um, capitalism has been the, the, the benefit rather than communism or socialism or feudalism or any of the other economic systems that are available. Is he right? That's something to discuss in class um, when I see you next. Speaking of which, this is pretty much brings us to the end of this week. So next week, when we're back in class, we'll get on to the ideas of Jürgen Habermas, um, some of which are similar to things spoken about today in terms of critical theory and so on. And his ideas are around public and private spheres, which have been significantly challenged by the development of the internet, amongst other things. And uh, we'll look at ancient Greek notions of oikos and polis and how they relate to modern day sociology. But that's the end of this lecture and I'll see you in the live Q&A. Thank you.